Welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe, the busy intersection where faith and reason intersect on a weekly basis, but only right here on EWTN. We are at the mothership where Mother began it all back in 1981. And your questions are very important to us, so email them to us at spitzersuniverse at EWTN.com. Check out all the Father Spitzer's websites at magiscenter.com, purposefuluniverse.com, and spitzercenter.org. And Father Spitzer's Universe is always available on our EWTN YouTube channel. Check that out. Also, our ever-expanding, it's kind of like the Big Bang there, the universe is expanding. EWTN On Demand page is expanding. So after today's show, we want to go to our On Demand page and check out Explore with the Miracle Hunter. Michael O'Neill has done a fantastic job for EWTN on radio and television. Journeys to miracle sites around the world to introduce viewers to these major events in church history and the saints who lived them, our older brothers and sisters. Check it out for free right now on demand, but maybe wait till the show is over. And don't forget to check out our show as well. Our topic today, honesty, charity, and objective moral norms, something we don't hear much about, but you'll learn a lot about them if you check out Father's book, The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, available now through the EWTN Religious Catalog. And speaking of books, the book of the month for EWTN Publishing, Spiritual Lightning, Answering Your Call from Jesus to Master His Values, just did an interview with Deacon Richard Eason, a very, very nice gentleman out of New Orleans, had a very popular book last year, so check that out as well. Speaking of someone who has tons of popular books, we turn to the West Coast and the one and only <laughs> Father Spitzer. It's always a pleasure to join you once again, Father. If you'd like to kick things off with a prayer, that'd be great. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us, the blessing especially of this ministry and our ability to serve in it. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon us now, Doug, myself, our whole audience and staff, so that everything we do and say will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. We ask all of these things through Jesus our Lord. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray Amen. for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Always great uh, to be with you again, Father. Uh, before we get to the topic and some of our viewers' questions, we've got a couple of interesting stories out there, uh, obviously sure. coming out of Easter. I'm um, assuming, uh, you know, everything went well with your Easter and everything over the last couple of weeks. Yes. So that's good. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and Mercy Sunday, of course, Divine Mercy. Uh, yes. So we've got uh, a story here. You probably heard about it. Washington Archbishop uh, notes that Biden picks and chooses parts of Catholic faith. Uh, Cardinal Wilton Gregory from Washington, D.C., on Sunday mm -hmm. asserted that President mm -hmm. Joe Biden picks and chooses elements of the Catholic faith to follow, that he is sincere, he believes in his faith, but he refuses to engage in some of the challenging aspects of it. This is the Cardinal's opinion. And he made these remarks on mm -hmm. Face the Nation. A, a one-time really good show. Uh, uh, that's my mm -hmm. editorial comment. Uh, he goes on to <laughs> make the point to the uh, to the host of the show. There is a phrase that we have used in the past, cafeteria Catholic, uh, which you choose what is attractive, dismiss what is challenging. Uh, the the cardinal said. I would say there are things, especially in terms of the life issues. Uh, hello. Uh, there are things that he chooses to ignore, and he goes on in the article to quote the fact that Biden in the 2024 State of the Union address only a couple of months ago uh, vowed to implement a Roe v. Wade style national abortion rule uh, if given the chance at a second term. He said, if you, the American people, send me to Congress, he said Congress actually, but back to the presidency, supports the right to choose, I promise you I'll restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land, something we just, you know, were lucky enough to get rid of in the last uh, year and a half. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, anyway, your thoughts mm -hmm. on uh, the Cardinal's perspective? I think the Cardinal's perspective is right on the marker. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I think um, uh, truth has been uh, spoken, and I think he did it very uh, um, faithfully and I think courageously because, of course, there's an immense amount of pressure on him, too, to conform to secular standards, and uh, he did not do that at all, but actually right. challenged 
Biden uh, to you know be a more faithful Catholic and right. certainly a more consistent faithful Catholic. And the life issues are of paramount importance. The church has stressed this over and over again. And I mean, you just can't be taking the lives of innocent human beings. Pre-born, uh, you know, as we know today, is is not a, a, a re relevant matter anymore. Right. Uh, before, when you might have been able to take some cover by saying, well, we just don't uh, know about the humanity of the of the human being. Now we know at the single right. stage of the single-celled human zygote, you have a substantially whole, new, unique uh, human being. You 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 just right. can't do whatever you please with that human being any more than you can one second after the human being is born. The very idea that a few seconds before they're born you can kill them, and a few seconds after you should not kill them, unless of course uh, we we go with some of the new uh, enlightenment thinking now that says that maybe infanticide up to a year yeah, if Peter uh, you Singer have some someone, babies right? that have yeah Peter Singer yeah, and right. company but a lot of the people mm -hmm. on the hill right. you know they uh, they're entertaining this along right. with our governor the former governor of, uh, of Virginia there that uh, are thinking you know this might be a really good idea sure. well, you can cut you down know, on of that uh, <laughs> special needs children yeah. and stuff like that very expensive to yeah, take care right. of those you know yeah, that's why that's Iceland right. that's uh, got right. rid could... of everybody before they're born. <laughs> oh, but, uh, right? I As know. I mean, the tragedy before. is. Right. Yeah, it's it's happening. So, so I mean, yeah, I think uh, uh, Cardinal Gregory's right on the marker, right. and I'm glad he said what he said. I do think, you know, that uh, we can't keep ignoring this issue. I know that uh, Biden's going to make this issue at the center of his uh, re-election um, platform. Right. And uh -huh. I think, well, um, you know, if he chooses that, I mean, it uh, reminds me of good old Woolsey, uh, you mm -hmm. know, when he uh, finally says at the end of his life, well, had I spent as much time and energy defending, um, you know, the church as I did defending my king, I'll, I would feel more comfortable at the time of my right. death. That's right. a paraphrase. I didn't get it exactly right, right. but uh, there it is. I just uh, right. I can assure you that uh, boy, right. something you know, you know when you put politics so far ahead right. of innocent human life. I right. mean, uh, right. uh, for, you know, for I, whales, Richard, but for <laughs> you whales, know, but, you know, <laughs> for, but for, <laughs> for whales, whales right. exactly. Okay, exactly. Let's move on to a related yeah. issue there, and, and it was under Pope Benedict and, and John Paul II. You thought they had closed the cafeteria, but apparently it's been reopened. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. uh, there, there was a story here that uh, the Easter egg roll, and this came from uh, Bill Donahue over at the Catholic League. Um, yeah, he, it's funny because actually originally came out on April 1st, which is perfect, April Fool's Day. Easter oh, egg yeah. roll April censors Fool's Christianity. Day. Unfortunately, it's not. It wasn't a phony story. Uh, of course, there's the Easter egg yeah. roll they have at the, at the White House. Starting months ago, National Guard yeah. families mm -hmm. were told that their children could submit artwork that honored the, the uh, annual event. However, the submission must not include any questionable content, uh, and questionable content includes religious symbols, overtly religious themes, or partisan polit political statements. I understand the political statements, but, you know, it's not like, yeah. you know, Easter is when the Easter Bunny comes out of his warren, uh, you know, that's not yeah. the resurrection experience <laughs> that we're really talking about here, though it seems to be what we've, right. we've got ourselves uh, into, you know. Watership down part <laughs> two here, so, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, it just shows you the shift in priorities right. uh, in our country under our fine civil leadership, and uh, the priorities are certainly not in favor of uh, religion, certainly not in favor of life, certainly not in favor of religious freedom. So uh, all I can tell you is uh, uh, they have shifted toward uh, a, a politic, a nouveau politic, which is uh, politique, which is mm -hmm. uh, uh, definitely, uh, well, anti-religious, anti-life, mm -hmm. and anti-religious freedom, and that's um, what we're going to have to contend with, I think, in the in the near future. I, I think we have to do it intelligently, and I think we have to have that same force of political will uh, that has allowed the pro-life movement mm -hmm. to succeed. We can't, uh, you know, f flag in our will, but at the same time, we have to be very intelligent about mm -hmm. this and right. and make our cases, uh, you know, very well. And I, I mean, there's no question we can make. We do make exceptionally good, intelligent cases. I just think now we've got to get a hearing 
uh, from people who are, you know, receptive, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not only to uh, who's shouting the loudest, but receptive uh, to the arguments that really do show mm -hmm. that we are killing innocent human pre-born lives. And pre-born's got nothing to do with it. We now know um, that that single cell zygote is a full, substantially whole, new created human being and we should protect that life just as much as two seconds after uh, that uh, okay. um, uh, being is born into the world. So that's, that's where we need to go and I mm -hmm. think religious freedom you know, needs to be upheld. And, and there are some cases that are now coming forward mm -hmm. where, you know, religious freedom looks like it's peaking out again and right. actually becoming something of, of import. So um, I'm beginning to get a little bit of optimism in mm -hmm. me. And, and maybe if we can push that agenda forward, maybe we can now start having mm -hmm. intelligent uh, right. arguments about so the abortion you, issue. Where we, mm -hmm. So do you consider yourself an optimist in general, Father, or a bit of a pessimist? No, no, I'm um, I'm an optimist until the the, the bad news just <laughs> floods in so badly, okay. and then you know it hammers me over the head, and finally okay. I, I do have this little fleeting cynicism, mm. but I, I do tend to pop out of it because I have you know I'm too much of a student of history. Mm. I've seen too many times when you you thought ah the church is dead, right, this isn't going to work, or mm. ah you know uh, you know the. Uh, this uh, huge, you know, uh, Nazi expansion is just going to happen, and you know, and we're we're going to be up against it, and and of course, you know, we could have easily lost uh, that war, mm -hmm. um, you know, early on had it not been for Churchill and mm -hmm. for uh, some of our good leadership here in the United States that put together the lend-lease agreements and things. But I mean, <laughs> you know, let's face facts. You know, this is not a right. foregone conclusion. Right. Yet you can see. You know, in church history especially, just when you thought it was all over, kablammo! Like, right. you know, ten of these saints come out of the woodworks, all these woodwork, all these new things begin to happen, and you begin to think, well, the Holy Spirit really does have control. You know, the, the right. gates of the nether world will not prevail right. well, we against saw what it, happened and, and that's Gu great. Right, we saw with Guadalupe at the time of the Reformation, things like that. Oh, and, yeah. You know. We see what's well, happening, you know, over and over and what's over happening in Africa as a balance to what's been happening in, in let's say, uh, uh, the Christ, uh, Christian mm -hmm. Europe and even North America, kind mm -hmm. of, as, mm -hmm. you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, you absolutely, never, and, and also, guess, right. Mm -hmm. right, right. Oh, I mean, look at Our Lady of Fatima. Mm -hmm. You know that huge appearance. You know that at least galvanized uh, a good part of Southern Europe. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, it's. You know, you just right in the middle of World War II and the Spanish flu. I mean, just amazing, you know, what God can do and right. to hold the church together. And he does it. Right. I mean, uh, and, the, you know, miracles of the sun are, uh, you right. know, a part of the plan. So, um, right. you know, don't count uh, the church out. Don't count God out. Don't count anything out. Just keep working right. like there's no tomorrow. And we will be victorious in uh, whatever way right. God chooses. But I'll tell you this uh, at the same time, it's worth it. It's right. just worth it to hang in there, worth it right. to take the abuse, worth it to keep forming good, intelligent, um, you know, uh, saintly good arguments. Uh, you know, let's, let's keep right. our fight uh, going. Right. Uh, that's going to be the main thing that matters. Right. Well, the Great War was a war to end all wars. It didn't end it. Uh, there's always going to be these things. Our yeah. Lord told us that, so we, we have to just stay faithful. Yep. Here's another story I figure you, uh, you, you know all about. Cause it's a couple of weeks old, but I wanted to get it because of your scientific uh, focus. Two priests and cosmologists mm -hmm. from the Vatican Observatory have made further progress in developing a new mathematical method to understand the Big Bang Theory, which describes the first moments of the universe. The observatory statement points mm -hmm. out that Albert Einstein's theory of general rel relativity talks about that. However, there are still unresolved questions about the laws of physics during the first moments of the universe and how gravity works on extremely small scales, which can be studied using quantum mechanics, which you've been talking a lot about on mm -hmm. the show as well. Mm -hmm. uh, in the new article mm -hmm. in the canonical equivalence between the Jordan and Einstein frames, I'm, I'm reading this because I'm sure you know what I'm talking, you know what this means mm -hmm. when I don't, yeah. uh, the two uh, particular uh, priests and cosmologists uh, Giantani and Galvanerni, 
Galverni, Galverni mm -hmm. demonstrate how they can map the mm -hmm. solution to a physical problem from an alternative theory of gravity to general relativity through a mathematical trick that they use. Uh, and talking of who we are mm -hmm. and where do we come from. So uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had heard mm -hmm. anything about that. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, I think what they're doing actually is not so much describing a creation moment, but it is, uh, you know, a good valid defense of the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. the, the main thing, though, that um, to remember is that uh, the moment of creation might have given rise uh, to a quantum a gravitational uh, configuration. Now that would be what they're talking about there is that, uh, you know, gravity is quantized. It's not in a, uh, today, of course, uh, you mm -hmm. know, in fact, just, you know, a split second after the, the Big Bang, you know, what you have is a transition from quantized gravity uh, where the four forces are basically in unity with one another. That transitions to what's called general relativity physics. Mm -hmm. And then at that juncture, space-time becomes uh, the modus you know, operandi, if I can put it that way, of gravity. In other words, the, mass, uh, the, the density of mass energy in the space-time continuum uh, is what is going to hold things together uh, just you know, a split second after the Big Bang mm -hmm. when you have that transition. So basically the, the, the trick is how do you explain how to move from quantized gravity over to um, you know, the uh, general theory of relativity where mm -hmm. gravity is really explained uh, by the mass energy, uh, the density of mass energy in the space-time continuum. Mm -hmm. How do you explain getting that space-time continuum transition? They have a theory uh, which looks like a very good candidate for mm -hmm. doing that. Okay. Uh, do we still need a, a creation moment? Uh, looks like we very much do mm -hmm. because um, of really three things. I mean, as you probably know, it's not just our universe, um, but, you know, a lot of hypothetical esoteric, um, you know, universes like a gigantic multiverse mm -hmm. or string universes in the higher dimensional space of uh, string theory mm -hmm. or bouncing universes that, you know, bou right. uh, expand and contract and expand and contract. Those are three models that have been postulated for a very long period of time. Now, those models, all of them, you know, uh, now seem to need a beginning. Notwithstanding the fact that for a while, for almost 10 years, um, this kind of fractal multiverse coming out of eternal inflation um, was, uh, you know, the, uh, the, you know, going to give rise to an infinite multiverse, eternal inflation, no beginning. It seemed like, you know, almost a creation event or God was not necessary. Well, of all ironies, mm -hmm. you now have Stephen Hawking and Thomas Hertog. Mm -hmm. Stephen, when I, you know, was uh, in an animated discussion with Stephen on, uh, and his um, partner in his book, uh, Leonard Mladenov, at the time, uh, 2010, really, but um, you know, 14 years ago now, uh, I was in the, uh, you know, on the Larry King show with him. At that time, Stephen was not at all convinced of a beginning of, of, of the multiverse. Uh, but then in 2018, he wrote an article called A Smooth Exit uh, from Eternal Inflation. Underline that word, eternal, right? Mm. A smooth exit from eternal inflation. And in that article, what he shows is that uh, the odds of us um, coming out of this uh, eternal inflating condition, which would just be chaotic, mm -hmm. would not have been uh, a smooth universe. And, you know, he shows also that any kind of fractal models to get us out um, in a sm smoother condition just wouldn't happen. And so uh, Hawking made these three observations along with his Belgian partner, uh, Dr. Thomas Hertog, very, two very bright people to say the mm -hmm. least. They came up with three conclusions that are really important. And you can read about this on the Cambridge University website. But number one, uh, a multiverse very, very likely is going to have to have a beginning because e inflation is going to have to have a beginning. Uh, in other words, he, he discredits eternal inflation as a real possibility that could generate our universe. So just think of that for a moment, just talking about a beginning uh, of the multiverse. So that kind of option of eternal inflation, the eternal multiverse disappears. The second thing is, is there's a problem called Boltzmann brain problems. Thomas Banks, a variety of other people are showing, right, that uh, there are real problems with eternal inflation on another level mm -hmm. uh, that seems to imply a beginning of inflation as well. And, and of course, that's going to mean 
uh, that you can't have really an infinite multiverse. You're going to have to have a finite number of bubble universes in the multiverse. Then you have a, another series of uh, you know discoveries that were made that basically show um, when you combine it, uh, what, what Hawking does is combine this previous data with his own new data from LISA and LIGO, the two gravitational wave detectors. And what he shows is that basically if you do have a multiverse, and that's what he says, if, if, we, he says we haven't proven, we're not down to one universe yet, he says. Mm -hmm. However, what we can know is that there's a beginning to inflation, a beginning to the multiverse, mm -hmm. and the multiverse which could generate our universe would have to have a mm -hmm. very small number of bubble universes, most of which are like our own. Now these are like shockwave statements uh, that are coming out into the uh, cosmic uh, um, physics order, the cosmological physics order, and so of course the idea mm -hmm. of well, wait a minute, would we then really need a beginning mm -hmm. of a multiverse, a string universe in the higher dimensional space, a string theory, uh, a beginning of a bouncing universe, a beginning of all known cosmological configurations? The answer is science seems to be saying this is the most reasonable and responsible right. explanation that we have. Right. And there's this uh, physicist who, in 2006, uh, Dr. Uh, Alexander Vilenkin, who um, he, he's one. He's in this board of Lincoln and Guth theorem. He's the V. Uh, but anyway, um, he came out with this statement, and it applies uh, after Stephen Hawking and Thomas Hertog, Boltzmann brains, etc. Mm -hmm. It applies very well after that statement, and he basically said it is said that a good argument will convince a reasonable person, mm -hmm. and that a proof will convince even an unreasonable one. Well, now that the proof is in place, in other words, if you combine mm -hmm. everything that Stephen Hawking has said, Hertog has said, a thing called the Board of Lincoln and Guth uh, theorem has said, the entropy evidence has said, you put it all together, that's the proof. He says, mm -hmm. well, now that the proof is in place, cosmologists can no longer consider the possibility of a past eternal universe. <clears throat> there is no escape. They must consider the problem of a cosmic beginning. Oh. Right. Now, <laughs> must, impossible, right? I mean, these are big words for a physicist to use, but we're looking at a beginning. And I don't have to tell anybody out there, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a beginning is a big deal in the physics world. Because prior to a beginning, physical reality, I don't care whether physical reality was a multiverse or string universe, uh, you know, or a, a bouncing universe or just our universe, it doesn't matter. If you have a beginning of physical reality, mm -hmm. then prior to that beginning, an absolute beginning, that universe was nothing. It did not exist. And number two, there's one thing we know about nothing. It's just nothing, and it can only do nothing. Number three, the, the third thing that we know is, well, if it was nothing and could only do nothing, then physical reality before the beginning, when it was nothing, could never have moved itself from nothing to something because the only thing it could do was nothing. Therefore, something else, something which is beyond the physical universe, something which is beyond physical reality, whether it be a multiverse, a string universe, or whatever, would have to move mm -hmm. physical reality from nothing to something, and it would have to have the power to create out of nothing. Right. And that is beginning to sound on the basis of uh, evidence from science like mm -hmm. a, a creator to me. Absolutely. And like I said, in, in, nothing in science right. can be 100% certain. Right, but absolutely. this uh, certainly we're getting to okay. the point Great. of looking not only at a beginning, but a creation. Well, Sorry I to get going on that. That's but, okay. Uh, I mean, I thought <laughs> internal, we have it, I think we're living through eternal inflation right now. Uh, yeah. especially <laughs> in, in, around the globe. So I think it started in 2020, yeah. as I recall. I think it did have a beginning, which we yeah. can actually uh, identify and yeah. apparently it's continuing on, regardless of what people say. Uh, there was another, to talk, uh, talking yeah. about science, uh, another Bill Donahue story, but it could be from anywhere. Vatican document yeah. uh, is at one with science. Uh, the Declaration on Human Dignity, which just came out, shows that the teachings of the Catholic Church are once more at, at one with science. Document affirms that every human mm -hmm. person possesses dignity, inalienably grounded in his or her mm -hmm. very being, which prevails in and beyond every circumstance, state, or situation a person may ever encounter. Goes on to say, as we talked about, to deny sexual differences, the Vatican says, is to eliminate the anthropological basis of the family. Goes on to note in this article that, you know, that's the statement that uh, Bill Donahue points out the Associated Press, if we wonder why we have these problems in culture, 
latest style book now available advises journalists not to use the term quote unquote female anymore because it could be seen as emphasizing biology and reproductive capacity over geni gender ideology which of course then is another triumph of politics over science goes on to say at the end Catholic Church is not a, is not at war with science but many of the elites in the scientific community are worse they have influenced legions of others in elite positions the biggest losers are women or what journalists used to call females yeah well here's the problem uh, once again uh, ideology has triumphed over reality and truth in other words um, you know, let's face it, gender differences are biological and they are real. And gender differences have very real effects. So in other words, if you've got a Y chromosome, you're going to absorb uh, certain kinds of hormones differently from if you have two X chromosomes. Uh, that's just a, a fact of life. I mean, and you can't get around it. And no ideological pr proclamations are going to make that change. So if you start, um, you know, at the age maybe of 12 or 11, start pumping uh, a person full of hormones mm -hmm. that were intended for a Y chromosome person into a double X chromosome person, uh, it's not going to be surprising if their mortality rate, I mean, starting at the age of 11, that you can see their mortality rate will, in, will triple Right? If you start pumping uh, um, uh, hormones that were meant for a double X uh, uh, chromosome uh, person into every cell of that body, you start uh, pumping it uh, full of uh, hormones that were intended for Y chromosome people, mm -hmm. you can see the same effects. You can see a tripling of the mortality rate mm -hmm. right away. And not only that, you'll see a huge increase in anxiety uh, for several different reasons. I mean, you're just flooding mm -hmm. the brain with all kinds of chemicals and enzymes that were never never meant to be there, never meant cellularly to be absorbing and transacting these things. And so, of course, at, at the very same moment, you're, you're, you're literally uh, poisoning these right. kids. Now, is this uh, something that uh, we can say uh, uh, for a fact, um, um, you know, is going to happen? Yes, yes, it is. I mean, the, 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 uh, the data now from, you know, several, the Den right. Hagen study especially, that's a 50-year study. Let's face facts. How much data do we need? And, and the, now the point um, is, uh, what, what should we expect to happen? Mm -hmm. We should expect that our kids should suffer from huge amounts of anxiety increase, depression increase, etc., the moment they start taking these hormones. And they do. And we should expect that there should, the mortality rate will triple. And it will. Mm -hmm. And we, we've got the data there. So what's the problem? The problem is people say, well, ideologically, it's gender uh, ideology that's you know that's determining the situation no it's not it's gender reality that's determining mm. this terribly bad situation which is why Europe right I, I mean so many right. of the countries who were the forerunners right. in, in this uh, right. area they have stopped doing it on the basis of science so uh, Great right. Britain uh, Sweden um, uh, Finland uh, Norway etc right. have stopped all doing the progressive these things uh, you know right all the progressive that's countries. right all the former progressive let me ask you a question with that's that, right on we, the basis of science we're so concerned mm -hmm. with the environment and the chemicals and what we're eating and everything else in the food supply and <laughs> stuff but yet we seem to be as you were indicating pump having no problem pumping people full of hormones and chemicals that th their bodies were never designed for well, yeah, I, the inconsistency can only be explained by ideological differences. Right. Biology cannot explain this. You shouldn't poison people mm -hmm. when you know that what you're doing is poisoning them. When you triple the mortality rate and skyrocket the depression and anxiety rate to the points of, you know, if you get a sexual reassignment surgery, the suicide rate goes up by a factor of 20 times. I mean, at this juncture, you just have to stop and start recognizing reality, mm -hmm. start recognizing what you're doing. It's a poisoning. Stop it. The idea that the, the uh, American, I think it was the American Pediatrics Association, I know there are two of them, mm -hmm. one of the associations, I think the American Pediatric Association, that came out and said, we need another study. I mean, I nearly fell off my right. chair. 
I, I, another well, study. Well, that's How because the study didn't support what they wanted to believe, right? I mean, isn't yeah. that what they usually? Another <laughs> exactly. study means this one didn't support what I wanted to do. Let's not let the facts get in the way what we want to accomplish here, as my old boss used to say. With that said, we're going to take a break, and then we'll get to your questions with Father Spitzer right after this. So please stay with us. Much ahead. Second half of Father Spitzer's Universe. Today's topic is honesty, charity, and objective moral norms. From, of course, Father's very popular book, The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church. And as we get back to Father, we're going to transition from some of the headlines out there to some of your questions. First up for Father Spitzer. Dear Father Spitzer, love your shows and your wisdom. I think we all support that. Uh, the Gospel of John says that Peter found two cloths in the tomb, the one which covered the face of Jesus mm -hmm. was separate from the other. Shroud of mm -hmm. Turin is one piece and has the image of the face of Jesus, yet the cloth that covered his face was separate. Can you help me understand this, Barry? Yeah, yes, uh, Barry, that uh, face cloth which was rolled up in a place by itself, as John describes it, mm. that is a, a face cloth that was used to transport the body from the cross to the tomb. We know that when uh, a body had, you know, especially the face of a, of a beloved person had been beaten uh, to the point of being macabre, truly mm -hmm. macabre. And you can see from the scars, uh, from the change in the iconography uh, between, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, the time of around 300 AD when the Mandelian came out, mm -hmm. you can see the scars, the box scars from, from the Shroud of Turin. You can see all of these things uh, that are present. I mean, the man had been punched so hard, you know, on, on, you know in the eye that mm -hmm. his right eyebrow was just stuck up in this position. Mm -hmm. He had a terrible scar above his nose uh, indicating that somebody had obviously hit him hard with mm -hmm. some kind of a blunt object. I mean, the man's face was terrible. And of course, I, well, if I might be a little macabre myself, mm -hmm. there's pleural edema fluid just flowing out of his nose and in his mouth. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, it's a horrible sight for, um, you know, the jaw is, you know, loose and flopping. So right. what they did was they took a cloth mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they put it around the face and then they t uh, came down around the chin lock the chin up and put it around the top of the head. So um, uh, then they, they would transport um, the body in a very respectful way to the tomb. When they got to the tomb, Barry, what they did was they took it off mm -hmm. and they rolled it up and they put it in a place by itself because it, it really was no longer necessary. Now what's so interesting and important about that, uh, we now think that that cloth is the face cloth of Oviedo. Mm -hmm. And we have a provenance for that cloth that goes back to 616 A.D. So, you know, we have records that say this cloth went to this bishop, that bishop gave it to that bishop, and then finally to Isidore of Seville, who put it in the cathedral of Oviedo in around 700 A.D. Now, you, uh, you say, okay, what's so special about that? There's 120 points of congruence. So if you do digital overlay analysis, you kind of have to reconfigure the cloth because it, you know, goes around and then um, under and then over, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the body. So you, you have to reconfigure it. But if you do digital overlay analysis, remember that face cloth only has blood stains on it, no image. Was, the yeah. shroud has... I was going to ask you that. So that's mm -hmm. important to understand, which I didn't quite realize when we've talked about that in the past. Yeah. Even read about it is, is yeah. that that was separated yeah. before, in a sense, the resurrection. So it, it doesn't that's have that correct. imprint. That's correct. So the resurrection... Okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And so if it, you know, um, uh, and that's very important. However, the blood, if you find 120 points of congruence and all these irregular um, blood stains and pleural edema stains on the, on the two claws, mm -hmm. uh, the main thing you can say right away is those two claws absolutely touched the same bloodied face. Yeah. Now that bloodied face 
was uh, the face of the, a man mm -hmm. who endured the unique crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus' crucifixion was very unique. Mm -hmm. By the way, you know, in Assyrian, you could have a Syrian crown of thorns, which had a top of it, right, you know, in the Middle East there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the Romans had a circlet that went around, uh, the, you know, the, the head, but not having a top. This one was woven with the top. Uh, right from you know that Middle East region, mm -hmm. and, and you can also see that the the thorns there are Syrian Christ thorns that are pretty much um, you know uh, intrinsic to, to you know uh, indigenous to um, uh, the Middle Eastern region mm -hmm. uh, in which Jerusalem and Northern Judea are located. So that's uh, very very probably. Um, the uh, area in which those thorns originated. So you put all the, the clues together, and what can you say is, first of all, John is reporting exactly what he saw. The beloved disciple so went, looked in there, saw that cloth, and of course, they took that as if it were as important as the Shroud of Turin, right? They, they thought this is what wrapped our Lord's face coming from the cross. Mm -hmm. So they take both of those cloths, but they take a slightly different path. Remember, Jerusalem falls uh, to the Romans, and of course is the temple is destroyed, etc. in 70 AD. Mm -hmm. And that time, we know that the shroud and the face cloth of Oviedo stayed another 230, 240 years um, in that region, mm -hmm. uh, certainly around the 300s or so, we know um, that it's transferred. Um, why the, uh, the transfer, no, we don't know. But we can tell from the pollen grains, three quarters of the pollen grains on both of those claws, the face cloth of Oviedo and on the Shroud of Turin, those two claws have about three quarters of their pollen grains come from uh, northern Judea and Jerusalem. Fourteen on the Shroud are indigenous to that region and four are unique to that region. They've never been found anywhere except on the Shroud beyond um, Jerusalem and northern Judea. So we know the Shroud had to be three, four centuries at least in that Jerusalem, northern Judea region. We then know that it goes to Edessa, Turkey. And the reason we know that is, again, the pollen uh, grains that are embedded in the cloth. Uh, a large number are also from that Edessa region. We also know that there was a change that took place in the iconography of Jesus in that region. So if you look at the shroud um, and then you compare it to the change in iconography, prior to the Mandelian, the Mandelian was the face of Jesus that was paraded around Edessa, Turkey. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, people today believe that the shroud was folded up in such a manner that the face was pointing out from this frame. So it was boxed, boxed in a frame in, in this face it was pointing outward and, and it was paraded around. Now the main thing, if you look at that face and you compare it to the change in iconography, it's the shroud, mm -hmm. all right? You just can't see the other parts of the shroud because I they see. were boxed in the frame. Yeah, and by the way, under ultraviolet light, you can actually see little remnants of the folds that came from folding up. And John Jackson, the physicist, right, showed okay. he showed the the, the little um, uh, remnants of those folds and how the the uh, the shroud was folded into the Mandelian. Well, anyway, uh, getting back to the Mandelian, um, which is the shroud that's mm -hmm. boxed in this frame. It gets paraded around. All of a sudden, you can see, for example, that the Roman iconography of Jesus had the Roman round face. And all of a sudden, Jesus in Edessa has an elongated Semitic face. Mm -hmm. Then you can see that, um, that you know he's clean shaven in the Roman iconography. Then you see the long beard mm -hmm. coming out of the Edessa Mandelian face. Then in, he's got the short haircut of the Romans. Uh, previously, and then you can see the long Semitic hair, just like the Shroud's long hair, mm -hmm. and just like the Shroud's long beard, you begin to see, and then you begin to see those unique scars, like that box scar above uh, the nose, or that raised eyebrow I was just talking about from getting punched in the eye, yeah. and so forth and so on. All of these things are manifest on the um, Mandelian, obviously, because the iconography changes in that direction. So we're very sure it was in Edessa. And, <clears throat> and then we have records of the Roman 
uh, emperor from in Constantinople comes over to Edessa and says uh, to the king of Edessa, well, I'm going to give you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> and the king says, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm going to give you this thousand gold pieces, and I'm going to leave you in peace, and you're going to give me the Mandelion. Or I'm going to uh, lay siege to you. You're not going to get any money, and I'm going to starve you out. Mm -hmm. Take your pick. So he took the gold pieces and the emperor of Constantinople. We know that he brings the, um, the uh, Mandelian up to Constantinople somewhere. Mm -hmm. So right after that incident, um, there's um, like, well, actually not right after, but 200 years after, there's a, um, a one of the uh, a big crusaders, um, uh, Robert de, Char uh, de, de Charnay. Um, um, I'm sorry, not de Charnay. Um, uh, um, uh, 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 Robert uh, uh, de Clary, uh, he comes along and he says, hey, um, I saw the uh, shroud fully unfurled. Mm -hmm. So the Mandelian, obviously, they took it, they unfurled it, they, mm -hmm. they unfolded it, they were, it was hanging there in the uh, church of St. Mary Blachernay, um, there in Constantinople, and he writes a testimony, which we have, mm -hmm. that says, I saw it. Uh, there and then of course it disappears uh, in the fourth crusade uh, from Constantinople and suddenly it arrives um, we know in 1350 because Geoffrey de Charny announces he has it. Mm -hmm. Now there are a lot of people who think that the the culprit was Otan de la Roche uh, who was a leader of the fourth crusade mm -hmm. that he might have swiped it uh, <laughs> from uh, the uh, uh, fourth um, uh, crusade uh, in the fourth crusade from Constantinople brought it up and he probably gave it uh, to the uh, 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 fourth ge uh, fifth generation ancestor of a woman named Jeanne de Vergy but Jeanne de Vergy she's the wife of Geoffrey de Charnay who claims he has the shroud in the 1350 or whatever it was mm. so the main thing though is yeah there's at least a traceable thought right, right. Uh, Autan de la Roche might, might have been the culprit but anyway it explains okay. why there's so many pollen grains from okay. Jerusalem, et cetera, well, on the shroud. That was and helpful. The face cloth right. has the same pollen grains. Right, right. Yeah, yeah it's interesting about the idea that it was uh, that was not part of it in a sense of the resurrection. It was already put to the side, and that the uh, it was shroud the itself side. was the mandolin. You know, when 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 you talk about yep. that, because sometimes people talk as if there's three different things. You know what I mean? There's the yeah. shroud, there's yeah. mandolin, and there's then two. there's right. Okay, that's that's very helpful. Yeah. One quick question we'll get to before the end of the book. Uh, dear Father Spitzer, in cases of exorcism, where do demons go after they are cast out? Do they just go attack other people, or are they banished to hell? Brian. Well, Brian, um, you know, uh, it's a great mystery um, as to where they go, and probably depends on what kind of a demon it is. If it's an angelic demon, it seems that they uh, still have the capacity to maybe go and attack somebody else. Um, but uh, we, we just don't know for certain. Uh, obviously, when a demon leaves, we know that uh, it does leave. Um, uh, maybe it is banished to hell. Maybe uh, it, it has the capacity to attack other people. Certainly, Satan, if he is the possessing demon, uh, he does move to other victims for sure. And uh, he's the one we can uh, uh, trace. Uh, uh, definitely, um, obviously, um, you know, in the case of Robbie Mannheim, right. uh, it almost mm -hmm. seems like, you know, it's a, a satanic possession in, in that sense. Um, and so uh, uh, in other cases, maybe not, but, right. uh, well, but the possessing took demon. took St. Michael the Archangel, uh, didn't it, in some fashion or form? I yes. Mean, he kind of sewed up. Well, so in the Robbie figure. Mannheim case. Right. So yeah. you've got to figure, he, he, it must have been somebody mm -hmm. of import he was taking on, I would have thought, right? Yeah, absolutely, and of course, uh, St. Michael is the one that commands him at the end, and mm -hmm. uh, th these were Jesuit exorcists who were heads of university departments and things of that nature, not prone to, uh, you know, uh, exaggerations right, of right. what they had seen, and they proclaimed, definitely, that his voice is booming out, you know, uh, mm -hmm. as a St. Michael, and you have to leave right now, mm -hmm. and uh, Satan obeys. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, this command, and of course, we know so all what, the lights went out, so not only that, in the Alexian Brothers. Right. So when that happened, was that voice heard in English? 
Yes, apparently okay. so. Okay. I don't sure. think it was Latin, okay. uh, but I uh, better check on that. But but okay. I think uh, I do think it was English, and okay. that's anyway. The voice is reported in English. Yeah, okay. uh, in okay, the diary um, of the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. Okay, go to page three forty four. Uh, we started talking a little mm -hmm. bit about we came out of uh, talking about the the abolition of man uh, and the idea mm -hmm. of these uh, these general laws that team seem seem to uh, go across multiple boundaries and multiple faith perspectives uh, general beneficence mm -hmm. special beneficence parents elders children posterity law of justice good faith ferocity law of mercy law of magnanimity. Now, is the law of mercy mm -hmm. so uh, broad as it, it certainly seems to be, or is it just not much more of a higher level in, in Christianity? Well, it's in, definitely in a, a very higher, a much higher level mm -hmm. uh, in Christianity. But it was thought uh, by many cultures, as, uh, simply on their own, independent of Christianity, uh, for example, uh, that you should have some mercy mm -hmm. uh, on prisoners of war, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, some cultures surely did not believe this, and some cultures were exceedingly cruel. Uh, to prisoners of war. And the Romans were one of those cultures. I mean, uh, they felt that they could just throw those guys right on into the uh, uh, gladiator rink or just, uh, uh, you know, torment them in some other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was certainly um, not a, a great deal of feeling of mercy, but a lot of other cultures did say, you know, uh, um, you know when the war was mm -hmm. over, uh, so we see this, for example, in the Edict of Cyrus, okay, um, you know, uh, these soldiers can return home. Mm -hmm. But there were, like I said, uh, Assyria had a very different view uh, than um, the Persians did. They, mm -hmm. uh, they basically tormented and killed a lot of uh, the prisoners of war. But, you know, we get our, our kind of prisoner of war uh, doctrines today that we have, you know, World War I and World War II, et cetera, that really comes from Christianity. That's mm -hmm. a, a much higher level of mercy where there really is a demand you know, once the war is over, once you've disarmed, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, you send them back to their country. You don't disgrace them, you know, parade them in front of people, torture them, and then kill them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so th these kinds of uh, prohibitions were, were put into effect. We know in the Revolutionary War, right, when uh, Cornwallis is ca captured by mm -hmm. uh, George Washington, he's surrounded. I mean, he could have just lobbed the old cannonballs right into the British and just utterly destroyed them. They were completely trapped. They couldn't exit by sea. He mm -hmm. had them dead to rights, and he didn't kill them dead to rights. What does he do? He not even disgraced them. He comes out with military um, uh, people there. They take the, the arms of the soldiers who have to give them up mm -hmm. uh, voluntarily. When they pile up their arms, they release them mm -hmm. and send them back, uh, including Cornwallis himself, mm -hmm. uh, you know, back to England. So, I mean, there's no, uh, right. uh, you know, intentional, um, you know, uh, right. you know, disgrace. So, you know, what did Christianity have something? Absolutely, Christianity mm -hmm. had something to do with that. There's no reason to persecute those people anymore. They were soldiers. They were soldiers who were fighting for their country. Thought they were doing the right thing. Obviously just because right. they're on the losing side. You can't just go ahead. Now, insidious and evil people, there's always exceptions uh, made for them, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who literally tortured, uh, you know, and killed civilians unnecessarily, et cetera. Those people, they definitely are still subject so, to judgment according so to international the, courts of right. law. So the sense of this is supposed to be that these disparate groups came up with very similar ideas and that shows that there's some sort of divine author? Oh, well, uh, to me, it does. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can see the influences there. Now, obviously, there is, though, a general influence of conscience. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's two influences of morality. We have that internal sense, right, you know, of don't be a barbaric person mm -hmm. uh, to your enemy. If your soldier was a, uh, if the enemy soldier was a valiant soldier uh, in doing what he thought was right, you know, why would you go ahead and kill him? Now, some cultures really followed that interior instinct. Uh, some uh, cultures did not. Uh, they did torment, um, you know. Well, some the, cultures, the enemy, and we even and know the, from from World War II, who would view a, a soldier who would surrender was not really a soldier. 
yeah. and would be treated not yeah, like yeah, a soldier, that's, right? That's correct. They were treated right. horribly. Right. And by the way, uh, any civilian uh, you know, who just happened to be in the way mm -hmm. uh, could be tormented uh, violently. I don't have to talk about um, you know the massacre of uh, um, you know Nan uh, Nanjing, the rape of Nanjing, or Nanjing, right. Nanjing yeah, yeah, uh, the ra right. rape of right. Nanjing. Right. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. right. Right. and so I mean it's basically very very uh, you know how many two hundred thousand civilians tortured and killed. I mean if, for no other reason than some of Doolittle's party you know got away. You know they mm -hmm. are going to pay them back. You know a thousand to one. It's crazy stuff. So, um, but yeah, so not everybody follows this. Although the Code of Bushido, mm -hmm. in fairness, uh, does actually say that uh, uh, valiant enemy soldiers and civilians should be treated mercifully. Mm -hmm. So it is in the Code of Bushido, but that gets reversed mm -hmm. uh, definitely in World War II. Um, and definitely they went against that code. And um, uh, this, the, the militaristic government uh, there in Japan was very, very... Uh, um, well, not right. just militaristic. Right. Uh, Tojo, uh, you know, Tojo and the boys. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, he got his just desserts, uh, right. um, you know, according to the International War Tribunal. Right. Now you say, once again, we are led to the same question raised throughout this section of this book. Can the source of our universal awareness or the binding force of these eight laws be anything other than a divine consciousness that can permeate and authoritatively bind every human being? And that's where we see the creator. Yeah, I, I do think uh, that is the case. I mean, myself, um, if we did not have, uh, you know, the, the, you know, some form of conscience, this divine inner voice within us, uh, an authoritative, or as Newman describes it, fatherly mm -hmm. uh, inner voice within us, if we did not have that, uh, I mean, world history. Uh, how long would we have lasted, honestly? I mean, I, you know, the, the, in a, uh, you know, if you go, you know, vengeance begets vengeance and violence begets violence. If you go on a straight, uh, you know, notion of retribution only, and we're gonna bloodthirstily get vengeance on our enemies, and we're gonna kill every civilian, if there was nothing there, like an inner awareness, uh, in a world history from the very beginning, we would have annihilated ourselves long, long, long before Jesus uh, got into the picture, let alone Moses got into the picture. There just would not have been, you know, any history of any ci civilization left because you could definitely, like, look at the Assyrians. Man, they, you know, when they, they caught an enemy and they, they did do damage, you know, to the uh, uh, civilian population. Like I said, mm -hmm. uh, Cyrus of Persia is some kind of an enlightened person. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, he certainly obviously has no influence from Judaism or Christianity, but he, he certainly, um, uh, I mean, he allows not only the Jewish people to return home, mm -hmm. but to rebuild their temple and, their, and their, the walls of Jerusalem. Now, I'm scratching my head. If that's not an example of conscience, I don't know what mm -hmm. is. So you've got, but it's this double influence. And some cultures really listen to their collective conscience, and some people don't. Some mm -hmm. cultures don't. And so you've got this kind of trade-off uh, that's going on, and you really have examples of horrible butchery of civilians and terrible things. And you have examples, though, of real mercy uh, as well. Um, and uh, you, so you, you kind of have to say there's some inner light that's mm -hmm. there. However, you know, considering that, is there more inner light after Christianity. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is, yes. I mean, the whole idea of slavery, mm -hmm. the minute, I mean, Christianity doesn't come on the scene as a powerful uh, entity, right? It takes 313 years, right, for Christianity to sort of uh, become a, a power within the Roman Empire. Right. Now, before that, though, I mean, you know, let's face it, slavery is the order of the day. And, and many, a lot of things many are, well, Christians you know, were slaves, yeah, right? I mean, many of the converts were slaves. Abs, right? So that's right. Beginning. And they, right. Uh, I have to, and they got educated. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, it, it, it's so funny because the Christians said, we don't care, slave or free, we're educating everybody, we're giving welfare to everybody, and we're going to give health care to everybody. 
Well, of course, it did attract some slaves uh, into Christianity, but Christianity never said, you have to be a Christian to get this help. We'll give it to you whether you're a Christian or whether you're not a Christian. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens is the Christians are busy educating these slaves, whether they're Christians or not. So if the, a slave got educated by Christians, but maybe hasn't become a Christian yet, mm -hmm. nevertheless, he's not going to like um, persecuting. So, of course, uh, the Roman Empire comes along, you know, during uh, Domitian and uh, Diocletian, and they say, okay, you know, um, we got to persecute more Christians, uh, persecute them all. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, they say, well, wait a minute, uh, Domitian, uh, there's a little problem here. Right. Uh, about two-thirds of our slaves that we have in the Roman administration, the Roman bureaucracy, happen to come from Christian, educated, uh, Christian educators, and if they're not Christians themselves, they've been educated right. by them and have a soft spot for them. Should right. we get rid of them too? And I go, yeah, get rid of all of them. Well, then you're going to get rid of two-thirds of your administration and bureaucracy. How are you going to run the Roman government? Ooh, that's a problem. This Skip is that order. Perfect so cliffhanger. Of course, <laughs> perfect cliffhanger there. We'll have to wait to next week to find out how they figured out okay. how to handle that. And uh, so if you'd like to give us your blessing out the door, Father, that would be great. Absolutely. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may Almighty God send His Holy Spirit down upon you to inspire and guide and protect you, that you might know and hear the voice, His voice within your conscience and His voice within the Master, Teacher, and Son, Christ Jesus our Lord. And in hearing that voice, do everything possible to follow Him and to teach others to do so for the good of our church, the good of the world, the good of world peace, and of course, for the good of world welfare. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father. Be well. We shall see you next week. We hope to see all of you next week. Father Spitzer's books and DVDs are always available naturally through our EWTN Religious Catalog, as you can see on our screen. Next week, we continue on with our same topic, Honesty, Charity, Objective Moral Norms. This week on Bookmark, an uh, interesting one, new scientific evidence for the existence of God, not with Father Spitzer, but with Jose Carlos Gonzalez Hurtado, El Presidente of EWT in Spain. Very interesting interview, interesting book, and a wonderful program, The Life of St. Margaret of Costello. This EWT original film we're very proud of tells the story of St. Margaret as she overcame her physical disabilities, dedicating her life to helping the sick, the poor, and the dying. A powerful, powerful program, Friday, April 12th, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Check it out. Check us out next time right here in Father Spitzer's Universe. We'll see you then.